All right. So the uh, next topic, I'm going to spend about uh, 15, 20 minutes to talk about how to make a cable antenna measurement, why it's important. Okay. All right. Uh, recently, I walked into a site. Uh, I talked to one of the technicians. So uh, one of the issues is I say, okay, how to make an uh, antenna? He's uh, maintaining a radar antenna. And uh, he said, oh, okay, I make a measurement. I do a return loss. But uh, one issue I have is every time the fir first day I make a measurement, a month later I make the same measurement, the me measurement results are different. Why? So basically in this paper, we're going to sh show you how to make an accurate measurement and uh, why antenna and cable measurement are important. Antenna is the only pipe between wireless system to over the air. So uh, in this show floor, there are many man antenna manufacturer, designer, simulation uh, software. All it does is try to uh, simulate, will help you to design a good wireless pipe, virtu I call virtual pipe between the backhaul to, uh, towards the end user. And uh, whether it's good or not, then it really depends on how people manufacture, how to install, how to test it. And uh, today, in this paper, we're going to more focus on the testing. So typically, we see antenna, we see it's a we, uh, typical, uh, in the industry, we call line sweep, or uh, distance to fall measurement. And actually, there are a whole bunch of uh, measurement and the, the line sweep. You have a return loss, distance to fall, and the cable loss measurement. That's what we're going to discuss today. And we really look at the cable as well as uh, antenna two portion. First of all, let's look at cable loss measurement. Cable loss is actually really, really critical measurement, especially you go to higher frequency because we all know the higher the frequency, your cable loss tends to get bigger. Especially if you have a broadband signal like a radar or EW signal, you cover such a wider range. For example, the radar on the airplane, you have a pretty wide frequency range and uh, depends on what type of cable you use, there's a pretty big loss. There are three types of uh, measurement f uh, you can do to make a cable measurement. First is we do a, a measurement for uh, you know, single pore measurement, typical for longer cable, but a relatively low loss, like a cell tower or a, a waveguide for the microwave backhauls. And we also can measure the long uh, cable on the airplane. So there are really three methods. One is a two-part measurement, typically for you know, shorter cable. You can uh, do a S21 measurement or insertion loss, depends on the industry you happen to be. And uh, if you have a pretty long cable and on the tower, it's not realistic to make a two-part measurement. We all know that. So we, in those cases, we use a single pore measurement. Essentially, you leave the other end of the cable open or short. So just force the signal to reflect back. So the signal will travel the cable by twice. And uh, then you can make a measurement. And we'll compare both two pore and uh, uh, single pore, see which one is the better one to use. If you happen in the very, very long cable or a huge loss device, you want to make those measurements like uh, on the airplane or radar. And uh, we'll use, you can use a power sensor to make those measurements because uh, when you make a power sensor me USB measurement, the frequency tr uh, on the USB is much, much lower so you don't suffer a big loss. So this is a comparison from two port and one port. Typically, two-port measurement is a little bit more accurate. There are some special algorithm Agilent developed to help to minimize the inaccuracy uh, created by the one pore because uh, one pore you really rely on the reflection. And uh, there's uh, more ripples. You can see uh, you know, this uh, yellow ripple. This is the one pore. And uh, of course, two pore is a little bit more better. And uh, we have a special algorithm that actually help you to remove the ripple to get uh, closer to the uh, two-port measurement. We talk about cable measurement. Next step, we let's uh, look at uh, antenna measurement. That's another element that is very, very critical. And uh, there are many uh, companies uh, over here, like NSI, a whole bunch of companies, they're doing antenna patent. 
And uh, what we do here, I'm talk not talking about antenna pattern or gain, that's a special equipment needed. Here, really, we talk about uh, Agile and Fieldfox really making return loss, uh, uh, distance to fall, or VSWR measurement, how we make those measurements accurate and consistent. Because uh, one of a networkizer based measurement, which like uh, uh, cable antenna test, is not, a lot of time it's not about accuracy, it's about consistency. How you make your measurement repeatable. Okay, let's look at the first measurement, antenna uh, isolation. Why antenna isolation is important? Now, uh, it's critical for today's industry. You look at uh, real, real estate on the tower is getting very, very limited. So you have a lot of uh, antennas kind of next to each other. And it is starting to interfere with each other. Especially when you test antenna, other antenna is hot. So the signal will uh, couple to the antenna and the test. So put a great challenge for a uh, test engineer or technician in the field how to make sure the measurement is accurate. And also in the, in the industry, you use a lot of repeater. That's even more uh, critical to have a good isolation because uh, if you don't, for example, your repeater to antenna requires about 90 dB uh, inst uh, isolation. If you less than that, then you, uh, you create an uh, oscillation between two antenna. Though you bring the whole noise floor up, not just damage your equipment, you can create an interference for the whole system. So that's uh, we use the insertion loss to make uh, uh, antenna uh, isolation measurement. So part one connect to uh, antenna one, part two connect to antenna two, and uh, you can simply do a insertion loss measurement, whether you can do a two-part calibration or just simply do a response cal or normalize. So in this situation, we actually uh, take a two-panel uh, antenna, 900 mag and uh, 2.4 gig, which is uh, uh, which is the uh, Wi-Fi signal. You look at today, a lot of antenna, they are kind of uh, integrated. You have uh, both uh, cellular frequency as well as uh, Wi-Fi, and uh, that uh, create a great challenge. So that's uh, easily, we can make those measurements. Okay, just now we all talk about in the frequency domain, we talk about return loss, VSWR, essentially they're the same, and uh, now let's talk about time domain. In the cable antenna industry, we typically not see time domain, we talk about distance to fall, which is a half of the time domain. And how do we create, uh, why it's important? Because uh, now you have, uh, in the early days, you look at, you have a cable, have an antenna, you pretty much can easily figure out which component is the problem. But then now you have a deplexer, duplexer, you, uh, a lot of time you have tower mounted amplifier, you get uh, many, many components in the system. And the distance of fault become the only way to identify where the problem is. It is different with technology we use over here is different from uh, technology used a TDR in the old days. You send a you know, impulse signal, so you have you know, any impedance uh, change, you see a reflex signal. What we do over here is we call FDR, frequency uh, domain reflectometer, reflectometer. Essentially take a return loss and do an inverse FFT to convert into time domain. Same, uh, it's easier uh, to do and more sensitive so, uh, because the, sometimes uh, a slightly impedance change, TDR won't be able to detect, but uh, in the uh, frequency domain it's a lot more uh, sensitive because we detect the phase as well. So this is an example of uh, uh, distance to fall measurement. Distance to fall, I see measurement actually is not accurate. Distance to fall is not a measurement, it's actually a mathematic conversion. That's create a lot of problem in the field when you do the measurement. Because since the mathematic measurement, we assume the signal is a periodic signal, so that means it repeats itself. So there are certain parameters you need to uh, educate or let the instrument know, for example, what's your frequency span, what kind of media you're transmit, because uh, you're no longer in the uh, vacuum, so it will be, have a velocity factor. And uh, since you transmit on the cable, you're back and forth, so the loss also play a role. So you take all those into consideration but the nice thing is, so you look at distance to fall, you can look at all each peak. For example, we simulate over here, 
we have, you know, have a cable, have uh, three adapters and the cables. And we actually can, you actually can read each adapter in each connection what's the return offsets. So this really, really neat feature for what we call system sweep. So when you go to, uh, uh, go to any kind of feeder system, including antenna or uh, cable, you can do a quick sweep. You can see uh, roughly tell you what's wrong with the system. OK, since the measurement is, uh, is done mathematically, so it depends how you set it up. If you do a distance to fall, you happen to set up a pretty long cable, and uh, there's uh, many reflections, signal reflect back and forth in this situation. So let's see, uh, here is supposed to be end of the cable, or typical we want to see the antenna. Let's see, you have a microwave dish or radar antenna. You want to see where is my radar antenna? Here's your radars, or uh, you know, or cell tower for uh, for that matter, and uh, and if here you get a pretty bad situation, let's say close to open. Here we simulate we leave this open, that means all the energy coming back, and the signal will be bouncing back and forth. Then create this kind of like a, a reflex signal is way beyond your antenna lens, so that's how uh, you need to. Uh, Try to be uh, need to be careful. This is actually not the signal you're looking for. And of course, you can fix that and just simply connect uh, low. Then these two signal will go away. So we look at the cable antenna uh, measurement. We look at the distance to fall. And then one of the uh, issue today is uh, we all know the uh, DAS system, or we call it distributed antenna system, is getting popular now. Why DAS is popular, you look at the venue over here, have so many uh, vendors, so many people try to use their cell phone or uh, data card. One of the issues is how you provide the good coverage with good capacity and the speed. Do you use the indoor system or distributed antenna? You don't want to have to use one antenna just blast everywhere that you get all the reflection. You're not going to get a good service. And uh, so that's people start to use a very low power transmitter inside the building. And of course, uh, you need a cables and adapters, uh, a splitter to uh, distribute the signal. And uh, distance to fall measurement and, and the return loss is critical here. It's actually distance, fall, uh, distance to fall measurement is a very neat uh, tool to help you to identify the problem in, in the DAS system. So this is a demonstration. We basically take uh, you know, two couplers and uh, hook up to antenna. You can easily see you know, each one. We can actually simulate whether we leave this one open or connected. So this one, if we disconnect, you see the signal is going up. And that's kind of help a uh, user to quickly identify which part is a problem. For example, over here, you can easily this, see is this is the antenna, this is the adapter before, you know, this is the coupler, then the second one, et cetera. Basically, you got one, two, three, four, five, so you can uh, easily, of course, in the real situation, it's much more complicated than that. You just have to test one section at a time. And another challenge is uh, you go to indoor DAS system, typically you have a DAPLEXer, and DAPLEXer is a uh, band pass filter, and uh, you have to really play around, look at your energy, which where you want to transmit your signal. If you just uh, blind it out, send the signal from uh, DC to whatever the frequency you set, you may see the, uh, say a false signal or ghost signal because the energy all coming back, uh, you just, you're not able to see all those uh, peaks. Okay, so for distance to fall, we said it's, um, it's a mathematic conversion. So there are uh, some tricks you need to do. The best way is we recommend use the low pass mode. Low pass mode basically is uh, all you need to do is tell the instrument, tell Phil Fox what, what's the length of your cable and uh, our instrument will automatically calculate what's the right frequency for you to use. So give you the best resolution and uh, 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 best uh, maximum range. And in some situation you may, uh, you may have a uh, filter or bandpass filter in front of uh, your uh, cable. In those situations, you have to use a bandpass mode. So you, instead of start from DC, you really look at your filters to start frequency and the stop frequency 
and set your frequency span within that filters. There's a problem for doing that. I give you an example. If you are in the cellular industry, you look at uh, cellular 850 band. Total 850 band for whether it's uplink or downlink is about 20, uh, 45 meg. Right? 45 meg is not much, so you don't you lost all the resolutions. See, uh, I have a customer call me up. See, I couldn't find my antenna because uh, he said 45 meg frequency span, but his cable only like uh, you know 20 feet, or i.e. you know 10, less than 10 meters, five or six meters, and. Uh, his resolution is, we uh, actually automatic calculate resolution is about five feet per point. There's no way you can find the antenna. You just see a kind of uh, a straight line. So yeah, especially for the uh, remote radio head, now the antenna, uh, the radio is on top of the antenna. You really, from the radio to the antenna is about you know 10 feet cable. You have to be really careful how you set it up, uh, the system. We usually recommend to use the low pass mode because the cable is the broadband device and the uh, antenna is kind of a broadband device as well. So you, uh, that's the best way to make those measurements. Not use the uh, band pass mode unless you absolutely have a filter in, in the middle. So that's uh, you know, how to, how to uh, manipulate distance uh, to fault measurement. You can do manually if it depend, uh, you need to manu manipulate the band uh, bandwidth, i.e. the start-stop frequency. So if you have a bigger bandwidth, like a broadband, then you have a better resolution. You have a better resolution if giving the point is the fixed, then you have a smaller uh, measurement range. So you really have to play all those uh, you know, points and uh, uh, start-stop frequency. And uh, in our instrument, typically we automate it for our customer. You just set your set your distance. We automatically calculate that. Okay. So we look just now. We look at the mesh, uh, measurement. We look at distance to fall. We can look at return loss. Make antenna measurement. One of the key things is calibration. And uh, there are two type of calibration. One is we call factory cal. That's you know the instrument have to cal every year. That's not the calibration we're talking about here. We talk about measurement calibration. In F Agile and FieldFox, we have uh, uh, different calibration method. One we, we call CalReady. So the instrument turned on is already calibrated in the factory with temperature compensation. So you can literally turn it on, connect, and then make a measurement. So regardless who, how many experience you have, you don't have to worry about the calibration at all. And uh, if you want to connect to a jumper cable, or extend the reference plane to end of the cable, we have a method we call QuickCal. FuelFox have a built-in eCal module. You can think about it as a eCal. We automatically measure the electrical lanes and the loss of the jumper cable, and we compensate that and uh, give you a more accurate measurement. And also, in te when temperature change, we can compensate the temperature change as well. And of course, we support mechanical cal. And the nice thing about FuelFox, we use the same calibration engine like used in Agilent PNA or ENA. So the measurement results are identical to those uh, bigger instruments. Why it's important? Because uh, you want your lab result is matching with your field result. And uh, it's a four receiver architecture, so a lot of advanced calibration uh, mess, uh, techniques can be applied in FuelFox, including like TRL cals. And uh, for two port measurements, same thing. We have, since we have two electronic cal kits built in on each port, so you can uh, calibrate to extend to end of the cable. Or if you just simply uh, measure at a uh, test port, we have a cal ready. And uh, you turn on the instrument, it's ready to go. And uh, you can set up a number of points or change frequency will automatically handle the uh, interpolation. In order to make the calibration really easy, we basically ask our uh, end user, just tell us what kind of device you test. Is it two port or one port and adapter type and connector type? we automatically choose the best CAL method. Because when you get in complicated narrowizer measurement, the key issue we see customer make a mistake again and again is choose the wrong calibration method. And we take that, we're taking care of that by uh, FuelFox CAL wizard. 
Last but not least is uh, we, in the show floor, this is actually the first time we represent, uh, we present our uh, instrument. This is a uh, 26 and a half gig, Pufox uh, cable antenna analyzer, spectralizer, power meter, it's all in one. And the show over here, the measurement result is consistent and uh, similar to our PNA and uh, PNAX. And uh, you know, take, go ahead, to, if you have time, to uh, take a look at the box. So in summary, cable antenna is critical for any kind of communication system. And uh, using the right method to make a return loss as well as distance to fall is critical. And Agilent have a unique contribution in calibration to make sure the measurements are, uh, are repeatable and uh, consistent with our lab. And at this time, I thank you. Yeah, I'm just, I've run out of our time and uh, feel free to ask questions. Since I'm the last one, I can all be standing here. Feel free to ask questions. Go ahead. Okay, so question is, what's the minimum uh, uh, bandwidth make a DTF uh, usable? No, this really depends on your, you know, how uh, the resolution you're looking at. And if, let's like, see, you have a very minimum, uh, you have a small bandwidth, but you have a huge cable. And, uh, and the connector you try to identify is, keep, uh, is pretty, you know, pretty far away. Then you have a very small, you know, bandwidth, that, that's fine. And, but if you have like a, you do a fixture type of measurement, you know, each connector is only a few millimeter, then you need a very, very high uh, frequency bandwidth. It's just, it's a mess, you have to play with that. How would I know which do I have now? Okay, uh, in our instrument, you just, all you need to do is set, tell uh, the length of your cable, give an estimate, you know, maybe 20% more than the ca actual cable and the instrument will automatically calculate and tell you the resolution. And you see, you can look at the resolution and say, okay, that's, uh, that's good or not. It's pretty, uh, you know, pretty obvious. Other questions? No. Okay, and uh, we have an instrument over there and uh, feel free to uh, drop by. Thank you.